All right. Hello, everybody. This is the 21st of May, and this is our FPGA meetup at Open Research Institute. And what we do is we talk about what we have done, what we plan to do over the next week, and if we need any resources, and if we have any roadblocks that we need help with. And so there are a lot of reports um, that are coming in over the last week, and I'll talk to to some of them uh, if the folks that have have done the work are, are not here. Um, so let's go ahead and and start our roundtable with uh, the the folks that are here. Um, so let's go ahead and pick up with with Paul if you want to tell us uh, some of the things that are happening in remote lab south uh, and, and anything that you need or or any uh, any roadblocks that you've that you've encountered. Okay, uh, here in Remote Lab West, we have uh, a little bit of administrative trivia to, to part to uh, to mention. There's been a reboot and software update of the uh, of the main server, just for routine software update. Um, I don't expect there will be any problems caused by that, but if uh, if you discover anything that's different that's causing you difficulty, please let me know and I'll try to fix it. Um, if you're using MATLAB on the system, there's a new password, uh, routine update. And if you need that password, let me know. And otherwise, the remote lab is hanging in there doing, uh, doing what it has been doing. Thank you. Yeah, it's been super useful. Um, and a lot of the work that we'll talk about today uh, happened in Remote Lab West. Uh, so we're trying very hard to get a Remote Lab South in uh, in Arkansas stood up, and some some strides forward uh, have been have been had. Um, with the initial meeting in mid March with the Region Five uh, Director of IEEE, and we're we're looking at uh, so we we prepared uh, documents describing like our goals and the available equipment uh, that's already in the area. Um, and this met with a, a lot of positive feedback. And so over the past couple of days, we've we've been able to to make a, a more full sort of set of communications with folks in the area. And it looks like there's going to be some meetings that are going to happen in the near future. And we may look at a uh, at having to spend some more time and energy on on developing a, a parallel lab, so very similar to to what happens in Remote Lab West, but uh, serving uh, the southern central United States. So look for more updates on that uh, coming up. So yeah, that's that's what I have for for remote labs, uh, and and as always, very very appreciated. I uh, couldn't do the work that we're talking about in this meeting. Uh, without the lab support and all of the software and hardware uh, that uh, is there. So thank you. All right, and I think Ken has an audio problem, but uh, Ken Easton is... No, I'm, I'm here. Oh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, just uh, not able to join the video fully here. But anyway, on um, the... Uh... <clears throat> Been working with this uh, Tez Tez software. At least got it installed and up and running. It's to configure the transceiver for proper clocks and uh, you know the front end filtering and uh, sampling. So I I know some of the details associated with how to get the uh, receiver chain to sample. I think at five megahertz is the goal um, or ten megahertz and um, it's using a 5x. There's a 5x down sample and a 2x that you have to kind of cascade. Um, so, set, I need to set up that whole chain. It's it's particular to to the setting that we that we need. And then um, there's some more global settings that uh, <clears throat> I need to, I guess, do some more basic research on on how we're how we're uh, setting up the radio. So haven't done a whole lot in terms of hands-on, but it is it is installed and um I'll be working through the 
parameters may be asking some questions of Michelle to try and get a like a a baseline profile. Um, other than that, uh, next week, yeah, we'll be working on that and trying to get a a, a build of the Linux that runs on the ARM. Uh, the goal is to to have it run some config register settings for uh, write, write some registers to set up the uh, the polyphase filter. So we we at one point a few weeks back we compiled the Linux. Uh, it seemed like it it did that okay, but actually getting into the um, programming steps haven't ever done that. So yeah, probably going to need some help there. But uh, that's that's on the plate. So I've got my marching orders. Just need to go forth and do. <laughs> so that's about all I have. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We're going to be bringing up or booting Linux uh, on the, on the target in the, in the lab, which is a, a big deal. Um, and we know how to do that. So we'll be, and all the artifacts, all the, the Linux image, just everything is in the TFT boot directory uh, ready to go. And then we'll be using um, a lot of those same uh, the pieces. So like the bit file and, 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 you know, other other uh, uh, pieces of Petalinux in order to make what's called a platform project in, in Vivado Vitus. And this will allow us to program the processor side and to use uh, live IIO in order to communicate directly with the radio. And at this point, we'll be able to test the Theseus Core's uh, polyphase filter or polyphase channelizer. So that's, that's uh, on deck and hoping to get that done by this time next week so we'll be able to to report some progress there and and just a big thank you to to ken for powering through um this is a very multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary sort of thing you're dealing with not just rtl development and and a very detailed and math heavy rtl in a, a polyphase implementation uh with lots of signal processing work and that in simulation has succeeded. Uh, so you not only have that, but you're taking this block and you're implementing it uh, from essentially a firmware perspective. Uh, you're putting it into a reference design and then bringing that reference design up and including that in a, a firmware target in a in a very interesting architecture that it has a, a zinc core and FPGA fabric. Uh, and then you're also speaking to it from from the software side, uh, and also, you know, you know, building a Linux kernel and getting that to boot up, you know, no big deal, right? So this is a lot of work, and and it's, it encompasses a very broad set of skills. Uh, and so, so thank you to to Ken for embracing this and and being willing to take the risk on, you know, uh, learning a lot of new skills. So we're looking forward to this being tested and showing uh, good good results in the lab. Um, I think the probably the the easiest way to test the channelizer is to produce a source, uh, some sort of source signal, and then you know you command the the target to look at different channels, different uh, frequency division, you know FDM channels, um, and if you see your signal, then well it worked. Uh, so that's this the proposal back to Ken to say like okay, is there an experiment that shows that this is working? Then at that point, we integrate uh, one of the things that we'll talk about in this meeting, which is the the opulent voice um, implementations. So the the uplink uh, protocol that's that's there in the frequency division, multiple access uh, for for this you know, polyphase channelizer receiver. So integrating a receiver that will actually like yes, you've been able to channelize the signal. Here's a signal. I'm delivering it to. Uh, the next part of the design, which will uh, demodulate and decode the information. So that's we're going to test both of these parts separately, and then combine them and and test the the combination. So that stuff's moving forward, and it's very exciting. So thank you to Ken and everybody else working on this. And then let's see, we have I see some things in chat, and. Oh, okay. So Ed is at work and he says he can hear us. He doesn't have a camera or mic. Uh, he says hello. And he says, he reports. It's okay, Ed. I'll just read it out here 
uh, out loud. It says, okay, still testing HDL coder output. It seems to be following the guidelines required in meeting test bench, but he is rewriting this all in Verilog because hopefully he'll be able to get the test benches in system Verilog, which is much more flexible and powerful. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with VHDL versus Verilog, uh, these are the two main languages in hardware descriptive language uh, world. Um, so these are these are software languages. This is software that you write. So this is code that you write, uh, and it describes the the hardware that you want to implement. And with VHDL, you it's very strongly typed. You describe your circuit, and it produces. Um, you know, essentially a bit file. This allows you to program hardware. So you're converting software to hardware. With Verilog, you have an additional um, tool in your toolbox, and that's System Verilog, which is works at a higher level. You can abstract a lot of the concepts and and organize your work in a particular way. So Ed is looking at rewriting things in Verilog because he'll be able to get the test benches in System Verilog and take advantage of the flexibility and power. Um, and he's also trying to organize the model sim reports so he can see if the units are being synthesized efficiently and the maximum latency paths, uh, which modules are done well, and which ones might need to be rewritten. He's using memory where appropriate and not relying on flip-flops when not necessary, uh, as flip-flops tend to kind of consume more uh, some collateral damage with flip-flops uh, and using lookup tables when possible. So so what Ed's talking about is uh, sort of a computer science uh, evaluation of HDL coder. This is a, a toolbox from, from MATLAB that we have access to. And what it does is converts Simulink models and uh, MATLAB functions, MATLAB code into HDL. And so Ed was inspired to to look at exactly how good this this is and and kind of and just get some computer science done so this will be uh, great to see sounds like there's progress there and and thank you very much uh for the for the help here uh we have produced some code with hdl coder over on opulent voice and a little bit on neptune and the results have been pretty interesting the when you set it up to use uh, blocks that are HDL coder compatible, um, so not all blocks in Simulink will work with HDL coder um, with this trans, you know, this this transformation process, this conversion process. Uh, but if you restrict your attention to the blocks that are that are tagged as HDL coder compliant, then the code that you get on the other end is is human readable and useful. Uh, but it is not necessarily the best code for the job. Um, and we've already seen a little bit of evidence of that on Opulent Voice. Let's see. And then Ed follows up with the main goal is to get a good sense of whether we are getting good designs from MATLAB and being able to have test benches that can analyze anything we make moving forward. Yeah. So HDL Coder allows you to, to specify a test bench. And I haven't spend a lot of time with the test benches that have been produced to see exactly what they are. It looks like there's a template for test benches. Um, so maybe that's a whole, that, that might be a whole video off into itself uh, as a walkthrough of, okay, so we have this design that we want to do in HDL Coder and we clicked the box on, yes, please produce a test bench. So I see that those test benches have been produced uh, and have not yet spent a lot of time with it. So I think we're getting to the point where, it's, you know, spending some time looking at the test benches and and presenting like, here's what you get. Because uh, I'm sure that a lot of you that are listening to this, you probably have like a favorite way of doing test benches, or you may even have a template that you have off to the side. I do. I have a particular like, here's my test bench approach, uh, managing files, handling stimulus, um, you know, setting up the device under test and, you know, it makes sense to me and it's familiar. And I'm sure that a lot of you have the same sort of approach. Um, and so looking at what HDL coder produces and seeing if there's an advantage to just having it include a generated test bench and, you know, from an open source perspective, like these functions are useful, then an open source 
uh, informing an open source uh, tool flow is is kind of what we're about, what we'd like to to help with. So we, you know, and Ed in particular is actively looking for, uh, you know, are we getting good designs? And what it was good about that design uh, and all that. And then he adds, and system Verilog is everywhere. Yes, so this is widely used industry standard. Um, well worth paying attention to. So thanks so much for, for all of this. It's uh, really, really appreciated and important, you know. Uh, none of these tools in FPGA or ASIC design are, are are really easy to use. And with the large quantity of of uh, of like proprietary tools, we're we're always looking for a place to, you know, contribute a a, a, a solid quality uh, open source either design using proprietary tools. We don't care making open source designs is is really our mission. But, you know, when you back up and say, can the tool flow, can the things that we use to create these open source designs, could that also be open source and to honor and support and, and to help inform the, the teams that are working on tools rather than, uh, you know, rather than designs? Uh, that's that's well within uh, our, our wheelhouse, if you if you want to look at it that way. All right, and then I have some some updates uh, from from Opulent Voice. So we have uh, from from Matthew's hard work. Uh, he's given several updates on uh, FPGA channel and also on Opulent Voice about a successful transceiver in RTL. And the initial logic was published about a week ago, and then over the past week, he's updated that to include AXI stream interface uh, rather than you know polling. Uh, more traditional interface. So I was able to get the logic to work. Uh, this is a minimum shift keying, um, you know, implementation of the opulent, opulent voice uh, for the, from the modulation side. So so we're not talking about the framing. The, the framing and the quality of service decisions are uh, a, an area of work uh, that's still a document. So we're still working on that. That work will be folded into to this, this uh, you know, transceiver design um so i know we've we've brought up the the implementation of like framing so so doesn't include all of the framing in the standard uh, but this is essentially a, a minimum shift keying a modulator and demodulator design so a, essentially a single block and this will be implemented or integrated into the reference design we're going to try to fit it into a pluto um, if that doesn't work, then we'll we'll move up to uh, the ZCU 102 and um, ADRV 9002, and and much larger chip and and you know, so that's that's the kind of the progression that we're looking at. If it turns out to be too much of a fight to include it on the Pluto, then then we'll move to to a larger larger platform. Um, but the MSK is working, and the AXI streaming interface was was uh, implemented and integrated. And also there is an AXI light. So this is the registers from the the zinc. So the processor side control. So the, you know, as a programmer, you want to be able to use live IO calls in order to communicate directly to the, the logic in your SDR. Uh, and things like push to talk are important uh, and any other sort of configuration. Now the same sort of interface exists over on the receiver side for the for the transponder for Hyferia that Ken Easton's working on, and and he has uh, those uh, you know the AXI light interface over there as well. So this is just how you communicate with your logic from the as a programmer uh, through through live I/O calls through memory mapping and and being able to to send uh, particular bits. We could do all of this with GPIOs, but having programmatic control over your logic is is really better, and and that was added, uh, you know, just within the past few days. Uh, so now, you know, looking at the design and and making sure that it works good in simulation, things are things are looking good. Um, another uh, improvement was some slight misalignment. Um, 
and the edges. So the edges of when you you go from one like symbol or one bit to another, uh, the way that all of that minimum shift keying is constructed uh, can create you know some 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 edges. And so that got smoothed out. And now I think we're up to the point where we can attempt to write all those chuckle commands that stitch the custom IP that we have into the reference design for the SDR. And then we will go through the entire process of creating a, a, a Linux image, uh, a platform project for, for Vitus or Vitus, uh, and then go ahead and try to get it on the air and prove that we are uh, inconveniencing electrons <laughs> and causing electromagnetic waves to go in certain directions. Uh, so very exciting um, on both both sides. So this is the, you know, Opulent Voice is the, the uplink protocol. We need a receiver and a transmitter. And so we're going to include both. Um, and if all else fails, we can fall back to just having a transmitter on Pluto. Uh, targeting the Pluto allows us to use a existing radio. Um, if we have to go up to the larger chips, then that's a dev board in the lab and not really a product. Uh, so, so we'll definitely try very hard to get it all to fit on the Pluto. So that's the status for, for most of the opulent voice work. There's also work going on in the general purpose processor side uh, for opulent voice. Um, and of course, opulent voice is, is being uh, used. It's, it's part of the, the plan at the University of Puerto Rico for for their uh, uh, Rockset X or rock, yeah, the, the rocket uh, launch for from Wallops. This will happen in mid August of 2024. So we're we're part of that launch, and and we're very uh, motivated and focused on on making sure that it that we have a working uh, version for them to use, uh, and they're interested in in including it in in the future work. So this has been a, a really good relationship with great students, and um, I'll I'll turn it over to to Paul if he wants to talk about the um, the advancements in the general purpose processor version. So this runs like on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so there's been some some work over the past week, and he has some planned work coming up. Well, the the primary thing that's going on with that for the support of Puerto Rico is to make the frequency acquisition uh, better. Right now it's it's pretty dumb. It really has to be tuned manually to the exactly right frequency in order to work, um, which is not convenient because the Pluto in particular has a pretty poor local oscillator in it. Could be off frequency, could vary with temperature and so on. So you may not, you may get it working one day and then come into the lab and it's a little colder in the lab that day and it <laughs> might not work as well or at all. So I want to improve the the receive side acquisition of, uh, of a slightly off frequency signal. That should not be uh, too difficult. What's in there now is, is pretty dumb. Uh, we'll make that better, hopefully in time for them to deploy it and be able to just have a fixed configuration that always works. That will be a, a big improvement, especially if the, uh, we're inviting people to use the receive software to uh, monitor the launch if, from people who are uh, in the right part of the world should be able to receive the opulent voice message coming uh, on the downlink from the sounding rocket launch. So they can't be expected to tune it in advance because they don't have access to the signal in advance. So that's got to work better. Um, there are lots of other things that could be made better, but that's the most critical thing for for this launch, I think. Cool. Thank you. That's uh, it's something we're really looking forward to and 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 working towards. So there should be uh, a lot of uh, additional. Uh, versions published and 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 we're looking at um, improving the documentation and and moving things forward um, from here here on through to August and uh, with if all goes well then we'll have uh, good demonstrations at Defcon in August and and also at the uh, 
a DUM event in uh, in October. So thank you very much. And thank you to all of the collaborators at uh, UPR. So the University of Puerto Rico has been great to work with and we uh, we're looking forward to all of this uh, throughout throughout the next few months. Uh, so so yeah, special recognition to, to Matthew Wishick for uh, working so hard on on opulent voice and and also helping find a, a pretty significant bug in the simulink model for for opulent voice uh, receive uh, last night so we're, we're making lots of progress across the board and uh, yeah that's uh, it's going well so for let's see the last thing is Neptune we're going to restart weekly meetings on uh, we'll target Mondays 7 a.m. so we can to catch as, as many folks that have to work as as possible. Um, and we're going to go ahead and proceed with a uh, set of requirements. Uh, so we've we've done backed off from from implementing um, working documents from from various teams and we're going to uh, make sure that we understand the requirements for for drones at five gigahertz. Uh, so this this works proceeding and the first draft of those requirements has been done. Uh, we're really looking forward to our articles about about some of the technologies used uh, like space frequency block coding and Zadoff Chu sequences. Uh, both of those articles will be published in QEX magazine. I don't know when, but they've been accepted and I've signed all of the, the proper forms. Um, that's that's good stuff that that shows uh, at least to the amateur community that we're uh, doing tech technical things. We have several other articles in, in progress and are looking to support uh, people that want to write uh, technical articles for for magazines like QEX or, or IEEE. So I know that there's a couple of folks at ORI that are working on IEEE papers. And uh, yeah, just reach out if you would like to to talk about publishing or writing um, or if you are interested in in joining any of the standards groups or regulatory uh, bodies that we uh, have have a relationship with uh, we would like for for your voice from the open source community to be to be heard and and for people to see the see and recognize the the good work that you're doing all right, that's it from my end. Anybody else have anything else that they'd like to to bring up? Um, any questions or comments? All right, thanks everybody. We'll see you on on our Slack and in email. And yeah, just uh, keep at it. And looking forward to to next week. We should have plenty to report then. All right, everybody. See you soon. <laughs>